Hey everybody, my name is Brian Charles Wilson. I am a cellist and composer, an educator and author, and today's course is called Arrangement, Improvisation, and Accompaniment for Flexible String Orchestra. Okay, so who am I? I am a cellist. I grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey. Um, I was born and bred here. And I decided to kind of do something a little bit different with the cello. You know, I liked classical music, but I also wanted to kind of expand my palette. So I learned how to improvise and compose my own stuff. And that's kind of what I've, as an educator, really tried to extol to my students is taking the idea of creativity and really making it happen on your instrument. Um, so today's course is about um, a piece that I made called Callaloo, which is a flexible string orchestra composition, uh, meaning that it's modular. You can have different people play different parts. Uh, there's different levels to it. This comes from uh, a... Uh, a book that I wrote called String Jams, where it's all different types of music, uh, like contemporary styles, like hip hop, pop, uh, synth pop, reggae, all these different things um, that you can do with the cello and the violin and viola, but I just didn't see a ton of it that was original. So I adapted one of the pieces from there for a string orchestra, and this is Callaloo. So this is a reggae piece. So it's kind of fun, it's something different that their students don't really get to play that much, right? So first off, it's a piece for string orchestra. So it's violin, viola, cello, double bass, and there's also a drum set part. Um, and there's two levels of difficulty to it. So there's an easy version and a hard version, and it comes with both. So the easy version just kind of has simplified rhythms and some fingerings, and the hard version um, has no fingerings, and the rhythms are a little bit more complicated. Nothing crazy, though, for a high school orchestra. Uh, so the way that the music is organized is it's just three musical lines. So you got your melody, you got your harmony, and you got your bass line. And what's cool is that violin, viola, cello, and bass have each of these lines written out already for them. So they have the melody line, the harmony line, and the bass line. So there's three separate sheets of music for each instrument. And the drum set just has one part. Uh, just because the drum set is, who cares? We're not, we're not drummers here. <laughs> so any of the instruments can play any of the lines. Which, so this is really cool. What it means is that you, know, you could have a viola playing the melody for the entire time. And then you could have the violins playing the bass line and the cellos playing a harmony. Or mix it up and have it some, something completely different. Um, there's also a drum backing track, which has a cool reggae groove, and it's got four different tempos, so they can you can jam along with your orchestra and play. Uh, you can practice at different speeds. Uh, and also, if you want some real customiz custom, customization, whatever, you can, I also include the Sibelius and XML files. So if you really want to tailor a specific arrangement for your specific ensemble, it's really easy to just kind of pick a piece here, melody goes here, harmony goes here, super easy to arrange for you. Um, the last two things that are really important are the improvisation notes and the backup rhythm sheet. And we're gonna get a lot uh, to these kinds of, um, to these things, which are, uh, really useful. The improvisation notes essentially have everything that you need uh, to improvise because in this piece there's a space for an improvisational solo, um, which I really think is really important for students because more and more you're not just asked to read off the page. You need to be able to create something and I feel like improvisation uh, is a super important part that might be missing from music education. I know I had to kind of figure it out for myself when I was growing up. There's more resources now, but I hope that this is a good resource that students can use and kind of grow their facility in that area. And the last thing is the, the backup rhythm sheet. So not only do you, you're gonna learn how to improvise, but you're also going to learn how to accompany because that's something that's really important as well. Because a lot of music is just 
a melody and chords, right? You look at any lead sheet, that's what it is. You got the chords, you got the melody. But what do you do besides that? Let's say you want to create a bass line from that melody. Let's say you want to create a harmony. How could you just have one lead sheet and then use that as uh, uh, an arrangement for an entire ensemble? That's what I want kids to really start to think about and, and grow with. So the first thing is the flexible arrangement of this piece. So it's really cool. The conductor, you can choose the level that you want. So if your orchestra feel, you know, needs on the easier side, choose the easier parts. If they're more advanced, by all means, go for the harder. If you have one section that's more advanced than the other, you can also mix and match. I wouldn't recommend mixing two different parts within the same section. That might get a little bit confusing for some players but feel free to mix and match for different sections. Um, so you get to choose who plays melody, who plays harmony, who plays bass line. And the harmony has two notes, uh, so one instrument can play divisi for two of those notes, so they don't have to get confused. They can just, half the section plays this, half the section plays that. Um, instruments can stick to one musical line for the whole song, or they can switch to a different, uh, musical line for a different section of the of the piece um so what that means is you know there is a very simple form it's like a pop music form it's two bar intro which is just kind of the intro for the drums to give you the tempo you got verse chorus verse chorus bridge which is the improvisational section and then a double chorus going out so what does that mean that means that you can have you know, maybe the cellos at the beginning play the melody and then the violins play the harmony, violas play the bass line. Then switch it up uh, at chorus one, maybe violas play the melody and then, you know, cellos play bass line, violins play harmony. You can do it that way. That might be a bit too confusing at the beginning for some of your players. Uh, that's something to grow with. But what you could do is just at the beginning say, you know what, cellos? you never really get the melody cellos and basses you guys take the melody violins you never play the bass line you guys are going to play that viola you get the harmony all right well you often get the harmony but you see what i'm saying right and you can play the whole um the whole piece down like that uh obviously if you want to make a more custom arrangement that's why i have the sibelius and the xml files you could uh just have you can tailor it to whatever you like uh, it's very easy to do because all the information is already there for the conductor to do that. Uh, and this, what's cool about this is it gives the different sections a chance to shine because, you know, the basses, they don't get to play the melody ever, right? They're itching for something to play. Same thing with the cellos. You know, we also, like, we sit there and it's like, all right, C, G, all right, we get it. It's the root fourth. We get it. Let's do something interesting, right? So you can get these different sections a time to really demonstrate what they can do. Um, and the nice thing is you can also practice with the four different drum backing tracks, right? So, you know, it's not just at performance tempo. You have something really slow, something a little bit faster, medium, and then performance tempo. Um, I just think it's a really fun thing that students can now, you can make it modular. You can make it whatever fits your orchestra. Let's say you don't have a really strong viola section, but you got really strong violins. Well, maybe give the violas, um, something easier to do you know you can give them the easy section the easy version of the piece and have them just play harmony you know just whatever fit needs you have for your orchestra this thing is easy to like adapt to that so uh now i'm going to play the piece for you i'm actually going to play it uh i'm going to cut to my first uh music teacher ever the guy who he he um he's the first guy to ever put a cello in my hands and we still he helped me edit this book. He's, I still work with him. I don't know how many years. I've been playing for 22 years, something like that. Um, so it's a real honor for me to play with him. His name's Larry Marino, and I'll be playing also with his wife, Marsha. They're both uh, retired string teachers. They just retired. They did their time um, over 30 years. Uh, so it's really nice for me to, to play with them and show you this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a version of the song, which I've arranged already, that has different instruments playing the different parts so at the beginning you know a certain section uh certain instrument will be playing the melody then at verse i mean at chorus one then it'll switch then at uh 
verse two, it'll switch again, and I'll show you on the screen who's got the melody, who's got the harmony, who's got the bass line. So you can see how like easy it is to make this uh, fit whatever you're doing. Here it is. I hope you enjoyed that. It's, it's fun, right? It's a bouncy, you know, piece and everyone kind of gets the chance to shine. So something that's really important to me is improvisation. Now, I'm not a huge like jazz guy or whatnot, but I do think that um, being able to improvise in different situations is super important. Um, and it's fun because you really get to express yourself. So this piece has the bridge section, which you saw I improvised on. It's just got an eight bar space for improvisation. In concert, you can make it as long as you want if you're playing with a real drummer, right? Obviously you can loop that section as long as you want. Um, you know, when you're playing with the backing track, I, I just made it short, so it's a nice little time to shine. So what's cool is the piece comes with an improvisation notes section, which shows the scale needed for improvisation, which in this case is just C major, very simple. You know, your guys are doing high school orchestras. They should be able to play C major, right? As well as the chords that are in the uh, the piece here. So, um, what do you what do you got? You got C major, D minor, F major, and G major. It's nothing that complicated. But you know, I understand that kids don't really have a not everybody, but there's not a strong grasp of music theory sometimes. So what's nice is I have this little cheat sheet there that writes everything out. This is what a C major chord is. It's got C, E, and G, and this is what it looks like on your instrument in this specific staff, you know, or, and also the scale. This is what it's like written out. Just so there's a visual, very, like, clear reference for what they're going to do um, with this material. So they don't have to be, you know, masters of music theory, you know. Um, so... When you're doing this improvisation section, you can have one person kind of solo over the orchestra, like, you know, like a star soloist. You can have people trade four bar sections. Uh, you can have multiple people solo at the same time, the whole section solo at the same time. You know, there's so many different possibilities that you could have. Um, 
And that's what's fun about it. You know, you're just not locked into one thing. So I understand when it comes to improvisation that a lot of kids, they feel stuck. And also teachers, too, because they just don't have experience with it, right? So here's kind of some ways that I use um, in my teaching to go about breaking down the barrier for improvisation. And here's just a couple simple steps that you can do with your orchestra that might be fun, that might be a break from your traditional repertoire. So the first thing I like to do is they got to know their basic scale, right? They have to know C major, right? That shouldn't be that difficult. They learn their C major scale, play it as much as they can in whatever octaves they can. That I'm pretty confident that they can do, right? The next thing is they can use a drone. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but a drone is just like one long pad notes. In this case, you would choose C because we're in the key of C. So uh, you can even go on YouTube and just type in cello drone C and you'll get a five minute video of just this. Right? So what you can do then is have your orchestra, you play that backing track or have have one section do just a C if that, that could work too. And you have students um, try to use the notes in the C major scale, which they have in the reference, plus they should know C major by now, and just mix it up a little bit. They don't have to use any specific rhythm. They don't have to play it in any specific order. So an example would be something like this. So you put on your C drone, and then you play whatever you feel, but just keep it simple. That's it. That's improvisation. That's it. Is you're just taking the notes of the scale, and we're con we're restricting the notes to the C major scale just because it gives us a basis to start on. Otherwise, you give people too many options, and then it's like I don't know what to do. Right. So just stick with the notes of C major, and you mix it up. Have go around the circle or go around the orchestra. You can do it one by one. You could do it in groups. It's it's super fun and easy to do. Okay. The next thing would be for the students to learn the arpeggios of the scales, right? Again, not that hard because these are not that difficult scales. So they learn the arpeggios and hopefully they begin to know what those three notes are for, for each scale because that will help them out when it comes to making the harmony parts and the bass line parts and obviously improvisation too, uh, like soloing. So another good thing that we can do is to do something called a nonstop improv. So at the beginning, um, what you will do is you just, you can put on the backing track, right? And uh, also just play a, a C drone too. Like either have one section, play a C drone, like just play a C, or just put the backing track and the, uh, and the YouTube video on at the same time. And you do something called nonstop improv, which means you're going to stay inside the key of C major. You can use whatever notes you want in the scale in any order, but you have to keep going with a specified uh, note value. So for example, um, let's say we start off with whole notes, right? So we can just play whole notes uh, inside the C major scale, whatever order we want. So let's do it. I, I start off like this. So maybe whole, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four. I'm staying inside the scale, right? I'm staying inside the scale uh, and I'm doing whole notes. Now, if that's too easy, let's try half notes. So how about one, two, That's still not that hard, right? Make it quarter notes. Okay, maybe you can do that. Make it make it eighth notes. Okay, how about sixteenths? It starts to get pretty hard, right? You're trying to stay inside the scale. 
Again, the C major scale is not the only notes you can use, but for the purpose of this practice, it's a really helpful limiting factor, right? So you can use that nonstop improv technique to work with your students and get them um, feeling more comfortable. And again, you're just, you know, they're just working with that one scale, just those notes inside of C major. So another thing to think about is space. Now we just did a, a um, improv exercise where I just told you to not stop playing the entire time, which is silly for a real solo. Because something we do as string players when we're improvising is we just play way too much. We just try to fill it off. <laughs> Something nice about playing uh, like a saxophone or a trumpet or something is like you have to breathe, unless you can circular breathe, but you have to breathe and that breath actually ends up making your phrases more musical because it gives it a sense of shape rather than just this unending thing of going on and on and on and filling up the space. So what I like to remind students is that you don't need to play all the time. Sometimes you should have your students just like, okay, I want you to play a small little thing and stop and wait. Then play something else and wait and stop. You can do this with the backing track, um, you know, just over uh, the, the drum track or whatever. It's, it's really important to have that space in order to get a sense of like an actual musical phrase. So for me, I might do like... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Using using this space is just, it's a way of actually making what you're doing more musical, uh, which is sometimes counterintuitive. Um, the other thing is, is to think about phrases, you know? This is something we think about when it comes to written music, um, but like, what is a musical phrase, you know? Is it, it's kind of like telling a story, you know? Like notes or could be the letters and a couple of notes are a word and a couple of musical words, uh, you get a musical sentence, you know? Having students start to think about this rather than just think about notes, like this is it, C, D, C. Think about telling a story. What is this, where does this line go? Maybe it goes here. That was like a, a call and response, like, an, you know, there's this very, as, as string players who, who've come up traditionally and classically, we often think in these like, what is this note? What is this note? What is this note? And it happens when we're sight reading too, right? But there's a bigger picture, right? And that's what I want to try to impart to these students is music is about, you know, uh, you know, not just notes. It's about a phrase. It's about a paragraph. It's about a story. What is your story? Um, so, you know, and sometimes it's a bit hard to get students to relate to that. So you can just tell them like, you know, phrases, they don't necessarily have to be that long. You can just try to think melodically and remember to take breaths like we were talking about. So, you know, you know, think about a melody. In some ways, something that can be helpful is singing. I don't claim to be a very uh, amazing singer, uh, but sometimes it is helpful to just try to sing to myself. <laughs> You know, using the voice can actually be a really helpful tool to crafting something that's more melodic and rather than just haphazard sounding. And the other thing to think about is sometimes if you have kids that are like, they want to be hot shots, they want to be two cellos. <laughs> you know, we've seen enough of that, right? Not every solo has to be like a hit it out of the park, hot shot, like a thousand note thing. And I often don't follow that rule. <laughs> you know, it's easier said than done because sometimes you're just, you're trying to like, you feel pressure to almost like impress, right? But sometimes doing that is 
takes away from the actual musical story, right? I can try to do What am I doing? I'm just, I can show people that, yeah, I can play the instrument, but am I really saying anything? Maybe something more simple is actually much more effective, like just doing you know what I'm saying I'm not doing like fancy stuff but maybe it has a little bit more cohesiveness and soul and direction okay so if your students get frustrated and they're like I don't know how to improvise I don't know what I'm doing that happens I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with that in the past steal ideas from the melody right that's that's what jazz artists have done you know that's what classical uh guys in the past you know beethoven and bach and whatever they would just take ideas from the melody and then expand upon that you know uh, it's it's nothing so crazy so if i take the melody here take something that i like so i do maybe here's a here's the beginning of the melody in the verse <laughs> Right, those are all kind of variations on the same rhythm or the trajectory of that melody, right? It's I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm just using that as a guideline. And that's that's something that I feel like is helpful for students that are just like, I don't know what to do. There's too many options. Well, steal something. I don't care. That's what it's there for. Use the ideas and try to make them your own. Change one note. Change no notes. Change a rhythm. Play a rhythm wrong. Like, there you go. You're improvising. You know what I'm saying? Um, so an idea would be to, you know, you take a, me a melody uh, part and you fragment it. Maybe you tweak it just slightly. It could be one note or a rhythm. And maybe you just repeat a certain phrase. I like this thing. <laughs> Right? Maybe I just did that. That was one little melodic part of the melody, but I just looped it, right? It's, it's, that's perfect. That's improvisation, you know? Um, the other thing that is interesting to think about, and this is something that we don't really think about that much because we don't play like groove-based music. You know, we don't come from a groove-based tradition. Um, Though Vivaldi and stuff can get pretty cool, right? It's like sounds like like you know 17th century rock and roll, but you know the majority of time that we're used to, we're not used to locking in with a drummer, we're not used to locking in with a bass player or something, uh, where you know a beginning guitarist or whatever who's in a band, they might have more experience with that, even though they probably don't know how to read music or anything like that. So the idea is about playing in the pocket, so. What does that actually mean? Um, it means staying with the rhythm, uh, or, or you can go against the pocket playing outside of the rhythm. This is something I've always had kind of difficulty with as a string player, again, because we don't come from that tradition, is feeling the beat and making my playing really sync up with what I'm uh, hearing in the drum track. All right? So I'll give you an example um of playing in the pocket right so i'm going to really try to stay in the subdivision and i'll just make the subdivision very simple here just like an eighth note okay here's what it would sound like <laughs> See what I'm doing there? I'm really trying to line up with the rhythm. So I'm making something up, but I'm making sure I don't get out of it. Now here would be an example of playing not in the pocket.
So in that example, I'm still playing something kind of interesting, right? But I'm not really lining up with the beats so much. I'm kind of avoiding them a little bit. Trust me, it's a lot easier to avoid the beat than it is to stay with the beat. But what can be really cool is actually mixing the two. So like, there's might be some parts of the solo where I really want to stick with the beat and make it lock in. Like, maybe I'll do 16th something. <laughs> Now, not so much. Back into it. Right? So, I can kind of float back and forth in between the rhythm. So staying with the pocket, going against the pocket. This is something that's kind of a powerful tool. It's a lot, again, it's a lot easier to not be in the pocket because, you know, that's what we're used to and you don't have to really listen to the drums as much. Uh, but feeling those subdivisions um, is really important for building like a rhythmic sense of improvisation, which is something that we lack a lot as as string players. And it, it takes a long time to develop. I'm still working on it myself. Okay, so those are some uh, basic um, improvisational strategies that you can go about with your students. And I think they'll get a lot from that. So the final piece of this is the accompaniment piece, right? So we have soloing, we have improvisation, but now we want to inform students on how do you go about, like I said, looking at a lead sheet that just has chords, which is what this has too. If you look at the mel if you look at every part, it has chords because I want students to get in the habit of seeing that because it's something that if they want to play their favorite Disney song and they look it up on MuseScore or whatever, uh, or whatever, you know, wherever, it's most likely going to be a lead sheet with chords. Anything that they want to play will be like that. So, but how do they, you know, if they want to play with a friend, how does the friend then back them up if, if they're playing the melody and they just have the lead sheet, you know? So my method is, is really about targeting that. So the final element is getting students to create their own accompaniments. So in order to get students ready for this, um, there's a backup rhythm worksheet with rhythms for harmony and bass lines. So there's a worksheet that breaks down some some rhythms that you can use as an accompaniment so for example um you know each one has an easy a medium and a hard rhythm that you can use uh for the specific accompaniment there's two types of accompaniments there's bass line and there's harmony um, and the harmonic accompaniment rhythm on this one is pretty simple because it's really just that reggae offbeat thing Although, you know, offbeats can be, might be hard for some students, but with the drums in there, I feel like it's a little bit easier to, uh, to hang on to. So this backup rhythm worksheet is to be used in conjunction with the improv notes section, which gives you, you know, like I said, all the list of all the scales, the, the only one scale, the C major scale, what it's like, all the notes in the chords that we're working on, everything written out. Um, so like I said, there's three variations of each rhythm. There's easy, medium, and hard. I would really suggest sticking just with the easy rhythms at the beginning, unless you have some more advanced players who want to tackle something more difficult. Um, just because this, you know, this is stuff they haven't really processed before and really thought about. But if you have people that are really like hot shots and they can do it, by all means, that's why I included it in there. So let's start first with the baseline rhythms. Okay, um, there are two different rhythms for the bass line parts. There's a verse and bridge rhythm, and then there's a chorus rhythm. Uh, and they're, you know, they're slightly different. So I recognize that doing the bass lines will be a lot easier for students because they can just look at the chord symbol and play that root note 
with the provided rhythm. So if they see a C, well, I'm just going to play a C. If I see a D, I'm going to just play a D. That could be the very beginning of it, which is, which is totally fine. So here's the steps for kind of using this. First, you want to learn the rhythm on one note. So if I take the easy bass line rhythm, um, what you're going to do is you're going to have the student with the, uh, the melody, which is also you know their lead sheet, next to their backup rhythm. So they can look at the melody. First, they're going to learn just this rhythm by itself, which is this. This is the easy rhythm. And I would just, you know, it's something they've been doing since Suzuki. Rest, 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 rest. You know, they've been doing that since book one in Suzuki. So that's nothing foreign to them. That's the verse and bridge one. And the first thing is to just learn that on one note. Be able to do the rhythm on one note. So the chorus is this. Again, nothing crazy difficult there, right? Again, I'm going over the easy versions just because this is probably where you would start with your, with your uh, ensembles. Um, okay, so first they know it on one note. Then what they can do is play that rhythm uh, through the verse and change depending on what note it says there. So what, what's the root note? So like the first chord is a C. Rest, rest, next chord's a D. Rest, back to C. You know what I'm saying? So they're just looking at whatever note it says there and playing that note with that rhythm. Okay, that's probably gonna be enough just for most students. But if you want to get more difficult, you can have students play the root note of each chord on beat one and play the fifth of the chord on beat two. And on beat three, uh, the root on beat three, and then the fifth on beat four. So you're alternating, right? Root, fifth, root, fifth. Now, saying that to a kid might freak them out, right? Because they have no idea really what that means unless they've studied music theory. But that's why you have the improvisational notes thing. So you can just show them, okay, here's your chords. You know, C, C major has C, E, and G. You're gonna go between C and G. You can do C, 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 G, G. C, 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 G, G. You know what I'm saying? So it's not that intimidating. So you could go, here's, here would be the easy version of the, uh, the verse with doing that thing. So now D minor. Back to C major. Rest, rest. Right? Here's what the chorus would sound like with the easy backup rhythm. So it goes. Right? This is not tremendously difficult. It's going to take a little bit of thought and a little bit of working, and if they need to write in what notes they're playing, uh, you know, over each bar, that's not the end of the world either. It's going to get them to learn, you know, how to use these harmonies. Um, and even more difficult is you can have students use the root, third, and fifth of the chord while using the rhythm to make a bass line. So, like, the beginning one might be, like, uh, for the verse... <laughs> Right? Here's the chorus. Something like that. Again, that might be too complicated at the beginning, but it's something that they can work up to. Okay. Um, so obviously there's three levels of those and they get more difficult. The, the harder bass line is, is, is a more difficult rhythm like. Right? That might be a bit too much to, to chew at the beginning, but it's something to work up to. Okay. So. Um, now let's go over the harmony parts, right? So the harmony ones, 
it, there's only one rhythm for the entire song. So there's you don't have to worry about switching your rhythm uh, as opposed to the bass line, which changes for the chorus. Um, so that's that makes it easier. And also, harmony parts should ideally be divisi so that you can split them up inside a section. Uh, so either you can split up one section or you can have two instruments play, uh, two separate instruments play one note each. That's another way to do it. And I recognize that the harmony parts definitely would be more tricky because it requires students to know the root, third, and fifth of each chord uh, a little bit more than the bass line, at least at the beginning, because the bass line, you could literally just look at whatever the chord symbol is, and that's the note you're going to play. But with the improvisation note section, it kind of spells it out what you need to know. So everything is there um, that you can use. So here's the sequence for learning the harmony parts on, uh, on the instrument. The first thing that you should do is just learn the harmony part uh, the harmony rhythm on one note. So that is very simple here. It's just the um, it's just the up chuck, you know, this this thing. That reggae feel. Might be a little bit tricky for some students. Um, but I, like I said, with the drum backing track, I feel like it's it's easier to do than just uh, without it. Uh, so, the next thing is to learn the third, the root third and fifth of each chord. And obviously they can use the improvisation notes worksheet to, to do that. Uh, okay, so then the harmony parts should have at least two different notes. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna have students choose a root third or fifth for each chord. Now this, you know, they have to kind of learn it. If they don't want to, they could always, again, just like play the, 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 um, the root note that they see above the chord just with the rhythm, it'll work too, you know, but it'll be more interesting if they use the root third and fifth. So have students choose a root third or fifth of each chord and ask the students to keep it simple, okay? And they wanna move as little as possible to get from one note to the next in the following chord. So for example, here's my worksheet. If I am playing the uh, verse part, I've got C major and D minor. Those are my two chords. So let's say I start on the third of C major, the E. Now I have to get to a note in D minor. So I have three choices, D, F, or A. I wanna move as little as possible to get to my next chord tone in the next chord. So if I'm on an E here, what would be the next closest note? Well, that would be F in, in D minor. So I go. And then honestly, I could just go back down to E and then play F again for the D minor. It's really not that complicated. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do with that is to instill the idea of voice leading for students so that they can just move the smallest amount from one note to a note in the chord in the next, uh, next, to a note in the next chord. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, this is not that easy at the beginning. But again, you could also write in the notes that you can play above each of the things, uh, each chord symbol, and that will give you a visual reference for how to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, it, more advanced would be to have students play double stops. Right, that might be, again, way too much at the beginning to chew on, but I can certainly do a double stop accompaniment using that rhythm where I'm doing like. Right, I'm just doing two notes in the chord each time. I was using, um, yeah, just the, just chord tones each time. Again, probably too much. Stick with one note and have them very, you know, keep it as simple as possible. Uh, because the more, you know, this is already a lot of stuff that you're probably throwing at them. That's why it's probably good to work at one thing at a time. You know, but like this, today we're gonna just work on this little improvisational idea that I gave you, or today we're gonna just try to make a bass line. Rather than, this is a lot of things. That's what's cool about 
I think is cool about this uh, this piece is that it gives you a lot of things that you can work on um, with your students that are really actually super beneficial for them to become versatile musicians. Um, so yeah, I mean that is pretty much my presentation. I uh, I just want to thank you so much for watching and uh, giving me your time. Uh, if you want some more information about me, you can go to my website, uh, brianwilsoncello.com. And that's Brian with a Y. The other Brian Wilson is, let's just say he's a lot more successful than I am. Um, so yeah, this is Brian with a Y. brianwilsoncello.com. And uh, if you go to the sheet music uh, tab on there, you can find this, the Callaloo one, if you're interested. Uh, or just have... You can send me an email. My my email is brianwilsoncello at gmail.com. You can talk to me. I'm, I'm happy to hear your thoughts and what you think about this because it's an ever-evolving process. Um, you know, I also have my string jams books, which are really for solo instruments, for violin, viola, and cello, and they come in uh, different styles, like I talked about before, where all these cool backing tracks that students can play along with and then also improvise. But this is kind of a more expanded version that I just showed you so that the whole orchestra can get involved. Um, so yeah, that's my time. I just want to thank you guys. Uh, keep on jamming. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thanks again, and I'll see you.